So, um, yeah, the title on the, uh, well, first of all, thank you for being here. I know there's like five other talks going on, including Fred Ersem, followed by Kevin uh, Weil. So that you chose to be here is pretty cool. Or a mistake. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> so on the agenda, it says the future of finance is open source. I came up with that name when I had like an hour to come up with a speaker uh, with the title of a talk. So the real title of this talk is Atoms to Bits. And actually, I, sh I, I want to add Atoms to Bits to Networks. And this is based on this quote from the founder of MIT Media Lab in 1995. He basically said, the change from atoms to bits is irrevocable and unstoppable. And he's talking about this kind of mega trend uh, where everything that in the physical world becomes digitized. And as everything becomes information and we move into kind of like this internet world, space and time kind of collapse. It's really easy to access information across space, across time. Um, and what I, and, and this was 25 years ago. And I think what is happening now is with kind of the advent of blockchain based networks for finance is not only is all um, of finance moving to become just pure information on the internet, but it's all becoming networked. Um, and to back up a little bit, what this talk is going to be is just going to be a few minutes of the context that I think Compound is operating in and DeFi, DeFi overall is operating in and why it's cool and important. And then I'll dig into what Compound actually is. Um, so first of all, you know, democratizing access to anything is kind of a trope in the tech industry by now. Everybody's democratizing access to something. But in reality, FinTech, fintech has truly democratized access to financial products. Um, all of these companies that are worth a lot of money and are um, you know, used daily in millions of people's lives enable you to manage your personal financial stack in really granular and complex ways. You got Robo advisors, neo banks, derivatives exchanges, stock trading, crowdfunding, the financial stack you can put together in your house for how you manage your wealth is equivalent to like what only Goldman Sachs could do 10 years ago. But all of those products there are still built kind of on a cobbled together um, financial system that was put together over the past 20, 30 years that's non internet native. So they have mismatched standards, siloed data. If you go to Schwab and then you go to First Republic Bank, you have to enter all your information all over again. They don't share it all. Uh, they're not interoperable. Like you can't send value from one platform to another one. Uh, and you can't transform value easily either. You could have a million dollars of Bitcoin on BitMEX, a million dollars of Google stock, and owe me $10 for lunch. And it would take you days, maybe hours at least, and maybe days for you to be able to pay me. Um, so what we have here in DeFi and with crypto is an opportunity to build a new financial system that starts with um, currency, but then also financial products that are first and foremost internet native. Um, if you were to rebuild financial infrastructure today with access to the internet, you wouldn't do it in this kind of like siloed, cobbled together way that our current financial system looks like. Um, if I go back a slide, that diagram on the right is basically a payment flow for if you swipe a credit card at a bank or at a, at a, at a merchant. It runs through like four to six different gateways and um, uh, kind of like institutions for money to go from you to who you're trying to pay. Um, so what we're doing DeFi and crypto is building something that's internet native, currency and financial products, openly accessible to anybody that has access to the internet, uh, naturally networked, where you can send value from one platform to me on another platform as fast as a computer can process, um, as fast as computers can kind of process that transaction. Uh, and importantly, something that can be algorithm powered very easily. And uh, I can't really emphasize enough, this is a new global financial infrastructure that I think will definitely can and I think will change the way the global economy functions. Um, so this is a picture from a company called Alethio that does data, uh, basically on-chain analytics. It's a picture of like 10 different DeFi projects today 
Um, and it, what it shows is user addresses using each product, how many have used each product, and kind of like which ones have also used other products. And what it shows is there's this budding ecosystem of only 10 really barely viable versions of financial products that you can use to manage your own financial stack. Um, but if you kind of look at the vibrant activity that's, always hap that's already happening here and think about today, you can already, from your living room, program a bot or, um, or a set of smart contracts that takes your money and transforms it into some form of cryptocurrency and then uh, executes a strategy across these 10 different products. You could, your computer could run 10,000 calculations and decide to send $300 to Compound, $300 to DYDX, and buy um, synthetic Bitcoin on Uniswap for another $300 or something like that, and dynamically adjust your allocations across those um, you know, di different products every 15 seconds if it wanted to. So you can have like an extremely advanced um, strategy with just these 10 products that you could never do uh, in Web 2.0 or traditional fintech. Um, and now if you, what really excites me on this slide is if you extrapolate this out to 10,000 X. So we have tens of thousands probably of different fintech products that we use. Um, if you just open up your wallet and think about all the different financial services, companies and organizations that have been created that uh, kind of deliver all those different financial services to you that are just in your wallet, one day the amount of products that are available in DeFi is gonna be 10,000 times this size. And then not only will you be able to manage your own financial stack programmatically, but you can imagine like a corporation or a DAO um, having many, many different types of assets and much more complicated strategy with machine agents that are algorithm powered just executing different financial strategies across a very broad array of products. And if you want to get even crazier, you could imagine one day a government, and maybe we're not so far from that, a government with a billion machine agents that manage the financial welfare of, um, say, like tax revenue from their citizens in order to optimize for some metric, like GDP. Um, I think this is the future that we can go towards where we have an internet native, super efficient economic machine that's powered by these types of technologies. Um, and really there, I wanna stop and have kind of a call to action because you can see here, um, like I said, there's 10 and we need there to be 10,000. Um, every single one of these new products uh, exponentially increases the amount of possible actions that any user or entity can take in this network. So we need people to build 10,000 more of these different types of products. Um, so, you know, build, hopefully on Compound, but build complementary products, even build competing products. There's a ton of opportunity uh, in DeFi right now to fill in a lot of white space. And that, that, you know, that's supposed to be a, a, a give, um, but that does not work. Um, and I would end with this kind of section on the context for DeFi by saying it's inevitable at this point. Like maybe six months ago even, it wasn't inevitable, but um, you may have seen like China announce its commitment to blockchain and obviously Libra, that's one of the most important countries in the world and a platform that's effectively larger than almost every country. Um, that has, you know, has a blockchain-based strategy around finance. It's inevitable that finance moves from what it is today onto blockchain-based uh, networks, whether they're open or closed. How and when is still up to people like you and me. And like I said, there's a ton of white space and, and you can have an influence on how this develops um, in the way that you think that it should. Uh, so now I'll pivot into what Compound is. Um, this is a shot of our markets page and uh, uh, it shows at a really high level what it is. Basically, uh, you can supply assets that are available to be borrowed. Today we have $164 million of assets supplied and $40 million of it is borrowed. Um, most of the assets that are supplied to Compound, or half of them, 
it is Ether. Uh, we support seven markets, and most of the assets, almost all of the assets that are being borrowed are stable coins. So that means like the primary use case that people are using for Compound today is collateralizing Ether to borrow stable coins. So people don't want to sell their Ether, they just want to lever up by borrowing dollar equivalents to either buy more crypto. Um, we've had users tell us that they put a down payment on a house or buy a car. Um, but people want to get dollar denominated leverage out of their ether. Um, this is uh, a view of how it works. So like I said, we have seven markets. You, if you imagine each one of those cylinders is a, uh, a market, then any user, Bob or Alice, can supply assets into a market. Um, and once you have assets supplied into a market, you can borrow assets out of a different market what you've supplied into market one um, serves as collateral for what you're borrowing out of market two. And each asset that you supply has what's called a collateral factor uh, that determines how much you can borrow against that asset. So for example, Bob here supplied roughly $2,000 of Ether, and in Compound today, that would give him roughly $1,500 of borrowing power of any other asset um, that he wants to borrow. This is just zooming in into one market. Um, basically, if you pretend there's only three actors in this market, Alice and Charlie have both supplied a total of 3,000 DAI, or we'll just say $3,000, and Bob has borrowed $500, then the liquidity left in this market is 2,500 DAI, um, and we have an important metric called utilization, which is basically liquidity divided by total supply. So the, the utilization here is 25 over 30. Um, uh, sorry, the utilization is 500 over 3,000. It's actually what's borrowed over what's totally supplied. Um, so one sixth, and the liquidity left is five sixths of the market. That's important because it is the primary factor that drives how much it costs Bob to borrow DAI, and then how much uh, interest Alice and Charlie own. They split the interest that Bob pays back into this market. So this is the interest rate curve that determines what Bob pays and what suppliers receive. Um, today, every market has a different interest rate curve. They're actually fairly rudimentary, I would say, uh, Compound, the version of Compound that's live today that has $165 million in it launched in May. Um, so it's not that old and we have a ton of work that we're doing to make everything more advanced and kind of dynamic and algorithm based. But our interest rate curve today in blue shows the borrowing interest rate. Um, the X axis is the percentage of assets in the market that are currently being borrowed. And the goal here is basically as liquidity in each market is reduced, the interest rate goes up in real time for everybody, which incentivizes more liquidity to come back into the market because it's more expensive to uh, be taking liquidity outside of, out of the market. Um, and then as liquidity increases and utilization goes down, we want it to get cheaper and cheaper to borrow um, uh, because we don't need that much liquidity. We want it to be very cheap to uh, to utilize the assets in that pool. And then the, the red curve is the supply interest rate and it's a curve below the linear borrowing interest rate simply because um, the borrowing interest rate is dispersed pro rata among all of the suppliers of capital. So uh, this one's a little complex, but basically to date what I've ex explained is as a user, all you need to know is um, there's four actions you can take on Compound. You can supply and earn interest. You can withdraw what you've supplied and your interest income. You can borrow uh, crypto and you can repay what you borrowed. But we have this fifth function, which is liquidation. So basically what happens if somebody becomes under collateralized relative to the amount of collateral that we require for them to have to borrow what they borrowed. So in that first example where Bob had $2,000 of Ether and borrowed 500 DAI, what if his Ether started heading towards zero? Um, and we need to make sure that it doesn't go to zero and then his incentive is just to run away with the 500 DAI that he borrowed. 
Um, so all this is really showing you is a liquidator, which it can be anybody. They don't even have to be a user of Compound, but they have to be somebody who can call the liquidate function on Compound, can identify an under-collateralized borrower, and repay part of what they borrowed, and collect part of their collateral with a bonus, which we call the liquidation incentive, um, that today is 5%. So basically, if you repay somebody's loan, if you repay $500 of what Bob borrowed, you get $525 of his collateral, um, which you can sell back into whatever asset you want. But it creates this arbitrage opportunity um, that's open to the community where anybody can look for under-collateralized accounts and eliminate their risk from the co compound system. And today there's about 100 unique liquidators that we've identified. Um, most of the good ones uh, are bots, and it seems like they have basically unlimited capacity to perform liquidations, but they're just programmatically identifying under collateralized compound accounts and, um, and closing them. Uh, which is really cool to see, and they're just racing against each other. Some of them are funds, some of them are individual developers. It's a pretty interesting arbitrage opportunity. Um, so within the system that I've kind of raced through, there are three really key parameters that determine um, both how safe it is for users and how useful it is for users and manage different types of risks. So the first one are the interest rate models we employ. I showed you kind of this pretty simple linear curve. We just say if nothing's being borrowed, borrowing might cost 5%, and if everything's been borrowed, borrowing might cost 25%. Uh, and interest accrues block by block every 15 seconds. Um, and the interest rate model's goal is to manage the liquidity of each market so that we don't want markets to be 100% borrowed out because nobody can withdraw their funds then, the suppliers of the assets. We want every market to be between like 50 to 80% borrowed. Uh, we think that's the sweet spot of where suppliers are earning a good interest rate for interest income, uh, but there's enough liquidity where if they want to leave the market, they can do so immediately. Um, a second uh, important parameter is the collateral factor. So every asset has a different collateral factor that determines how much uh, you can borrow against that collateral. And what this does is manage risk, ex risk exposure to each asset. For example, the collateral factor of Ether today is 0.75. So every $100 of Ether, you can borrow $75 of any other asset. The collateral factor for Augur is 0.5. So you need uh, $100 of Augur to borrow $50 of any other asset. And this is really a function of the, our expected, uh, the expected price volatility of an asset. The more volatile it is, the more likely it is that it makes a borrower under collateralized at some point if it suddenly drops, and also how liquid the asset is. So we need to make sure that liquidators who liquidate an under collateralized borrower and receive collateral, if that borrower is using Augur, for example, are able to trade that auger back out into Ether or DAI or USDC. And if the auger market is very illiquid, then they would expect to uh, experience a lot of slippage when they trade back out of that collateral, which uh, disincentivizes them from performing liquidations. And then the liquidation incentive is the opposite side of that coin. It's the percentage bonus that you get for performing a liquidation. The higher it is, the more incentivized you are to actually perform liquidations. Um, and Two of our really pillars of the next year for our company are working on making these key economic parameters uh, able to be governed by the community. We truly want to get to a state where Compound is uh, truly decentralized finance and managed by its users and the community. And we also want them to be self-parameterizing. So it would be amazing if instead of anybody setting these parameters, they were algorithms that looked at the outputs of the system itself um, and optimized for some metric that was a proxy for safety or usefulness uh, and would dynamically adjust themselves. Um, and that's really just developing better algorithms and getting more data so that we can do that. Um, so yeah, the, to, to kind of summarize, the benefits for a user are today, you can go to a dollar-denominated stablecoin market and earn five to six percent 
interest immediately. Your interest income accrues block by block every 15 seconds. You can supply assets for 15 seconds, uh, an hour, a day, a week, a year, 10 years. Um, and you have the ability to withdraw it anytime you want as long as there's enough liquidity in the market, uh, which are interest rate models hopefully incentivized. Uh, and you can also borrow other crypto against your interest earning capital. Uh, it serves kind of a dual purpose as earning interest income and as collateral for borrowing. Uh, so you could borrow more dollars, you could borrow ether, you could short, uh, you know, some other asset that we support. And for builders and developers, building on top of Compound, which is kind of like the third pillar of, uh, that we're really working on over this next year, uh, we're actually going to announce a developer program soon, so if anybody's interested in building on top of Compound, definitely reach out to us or come talk to me. But with Compound, you can, with two function calls, supply and withdraw, monetize any crypto product immediately. Uh, if your crypto product ever touches tokens, you can sweep them into Compound and earn interest again for 15 seconds, one hour, one day, one week. Uh, it's kind of like a business model that's available to any product. Uh, you can transform your asset liquidity, like if you're holding Ether in your product, you can borrow dollars out of it, um, which makes your balance sheet a lot more kind of transformable and liquid. Um, and just based on these kind of two benefits, we've seen a ton of creative second order products get built uh, on top of Compound already. For example, the Kyber DeFi hackathon that I think ended this week had 18 products building with Compound integrations. The recent ETH Berlin uh, hackathon had 10 products building with Compound integrations. Uh, we're really hopeful and are gonna put a lot of effort into developing like an ecosystem of projects that are integrated with Compound. And that's it. Uh, this is how you can reach me and us. Our Discord is super lively uh, and it's the best place to reach our engineering team as well, pretty much like 20 hours of the day. Um, and you can email me if you want to chat. Um, I'm the strategy lead, which, so most of my focus is uh, really the entire business side of Compound. Uh, partnerships, developer relations, uh, talking to funds and institutions who are interested in earning interest uh, on their holdings. Thanks.